All right. Our lesson is entitled, Bildad Misunderstand God's Justice. I'd like to have an opening word of prayer before we get started. Eternal God, our Father, Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for this, another opportunity to work with the church school in this ministry. Pray, O oh God, open up our hearts and understanding as we labor here today. Give me wisdom and understanding as we reflect upon these lessons of life from the Old Testament. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Bildad misunderstands God's justice. Lesson text, the printed text, is found in Job, the eighth chapter, verses one through 10 and 20 through 22. Most of us are familiar with the book of Job for a couple of reasons. The fact that those of us who visit sick people understand the mistake that Job's friends made in their visit. Sometimes we would do best or better if we just sat rather than speaking when people are sick. Because sometimes we misunderstand what our responsibility is. We shouldn't always be judgmental and raising all kinds of questions when a person is on their sick bed. We're gonna see in this lesson that Bildad, he may have had the right intentions, but he went too far. Most of us have experienced in life a time when we didn't understand what we were going through. And I remember those who went on before me used to tell us that we should never question God. I don't know how many of you have heard that term before, but I can remember. But we're gonna see that we don't always understand God's plan for us, especially when we're suffering. And this is where Job finds himself. And we also have to understand that when the council met, Job wasn't aware of God's plan for him. He may have handled it a little different had he had known that God had rendered him up to Satan because he was a just man. The aim for change in the lesson. By the end of the lesson, we will understand Bildad's response to Job's suffering. Discern carefully when others misinterpret God's ways and grow closer to God and live faithfully in God's just ways. I can remember some years ago, Brother Nix and I was riding along in a car. 
and we began to discuss why good people suffer or why righteous people suffer. That's always an interesting subject and has been for a lot of years. But what I have come to respect and understand that although I may not know always what God's plan is for me in life, I feel like through it all, I need to always be prayerful and to always believe and know that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And I in focus in the lesson, Angela had been battling cancer for over six months. After so many sessions of chemotherapy, she was a shell of her former self. Her husband, Tim, could barely hold himself together as he watched his wife suffer. He often looked at her and wondered how she could continue being optimistic and keep her faith in God. She still prayed and thanked God every day since the diagnosis. They had not missed one Sunday morning church service. Tim endured it. Although the hope and optimism that he experienced from Angela and the people at church granted on him. How could God do this to my wife? He asked himself. One day while driving home, Angela began quietly humming a praise and worship song they had heard in church. Tim couldn't take it anymore. Frustrated, he asked her, how can you sing a song like that in a time like this? Why praise a God who does this to you? Angela was shocked by his question, but then calmly collected herself. Songs like that were made for times like this, she responded. I know I've followed the Lord as best as I can. I know and I've seen his blessings in my life. I'm not fond of this cancer, but if that's how God cho chooses to take me home, so be it. I've still seen him do plenty of good, and I'm still going to praise him for it. The question, how do you respond when you don't understand God's plan? I used to hear people say, and I believe it now more than ever, the real test for the Christian is not when everything is going our way or going well, but vice versa, when they are not going our way. Sometimes we become fair weather Christians. We only serve God and that's kind of what Satan had in mind in his communication with God about Job because he seemed to believe that Job was only worshiping and serving God because God was blessing him. 
And it kind of seems like if we're only going to worship and serve God when things are going well, then we are fair-weather Christians. Now keep in mind verse. Then answered Bildad, the Shemite, and said, How long will thou speak these things? And how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? What he was actually saying is, you're just speaking words, hot air coming out of your mouth. You're just talking too much. Our lesson text, Job 1, Job 8, verses 1. Sorry. Then answered Bildad, the Shemite, and said, How long wilt thou speak these things? And how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? Does God pervert judgment, or does the Almighty pervert justice? That's verses 1 and 3. These verses deal with the at a glance in our lesson book, in our Sunday school material. God is perfectly just. That's verse 1 through 3 of Job 8. A just God will punish sin. That's verse 4. A just God will bless the obedience. Verse 5 through 10. A just God will restore the repentant, verses 20 through 22. That's our breakdown of the at a glance in our lesson. Verse 4 in our text, If thy children have sinned against him, and he have cast them away, for their transgression. That deals with a just God will punish sin. Now verse 5 through 10. If thou wouldest seek unto God be times and make thy supplication to the Almighty. If thou shalt, if thou wilt pure and upright surely, know he would awake thee and make the habit, habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. Thou that beginning through that beginning, was small. Yet thy latter and should greatly increase. That's just God will bless obedience. I don't know how many of you have ever heard this term before. In the Old Testament, The term or the idea is kind of perverse. Discipline for disobedience and blessings for obedience. I don't know if you heard that before, but it is prevalent throughout the Old Testament. God blesses obedience and he disciplines disobedience. And this, in some degree, is the idea that Bildad was holding. 
verse 8. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to the stench of thy fathers. Verse 9. For we are but of yesterday and know nothing because our days upon the earth are a shadow. That's dealing with the idea that a just God will bless the obedient. And then last at a glance, verses 20 through 22, a just God will restore the repentant. Behold, God will not cast away the perfect man, neither will he help the evildoer till he fill thy mouth with laughter and thy lips with rejoicing. They that hate thee shall be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to, to naught. What Job's friends were doing didn't really help him because they were saying to Job you're not leveling with us for some reason God has something against you that you have not shared with us why can't you just tell us what it is. If you want to regain your health, if you would repent, he would heal you. Now I know you've heard this before. All sickness is not unto death. And there's another saying that we are familiar with also. If you do not well, sin lieth at your door. If you've studied the Bible for a little while, you know where that scripture comes from dealing with Cain and Abel. If you do it not well, sin lieth at your door. But God has a way that we don't always understand why he's working and how he's working with us but through it all as the songwriters say I've learned to trust in Jesus I've learned to trust in God I've learned to depend upon his word now that's completes our lesson text. Now I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then we're going to move on. How do you handle trouble when it comes into your life? Or how do we handle trouble when it come in to our lives. How do you handle being in the presence of a person who is sick? Job had lost everything, lost his cattle and children, 
sores broke out from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. And his friends come to talk to him. Sat quietly for days and didn't say a word. And when they spoke, they accused him. That wasn't being helpful as friends. We need to be careful that we're not sowing seeds of doubt when we visit people who are sick or going through tough times. The people, place, and times. Why do bad things happen to, to good people? Does God not care enough to help people? If he cares, why can't he stop the bad things? Is God not just? Does he not have enough power to uphold his justice? These questions have long plagued humanity when discussed in philosophies and theological circles. The topic is called theocracy from the Greek term God justice, God and justice. Some cultures in Job's time believed that God simply did not care about doing, doing of lowly morals. Others held that people should often anger a God without knowing it. But the proper cat's tail atonement sacrifice could appease him. Job insists that Yahweh cares for his people and was revealed him, has revealed him to his people. He can honestly examine, we can honestly examine our minds and our actions and know that for certain if we have sinned against God. God is confident that his friend is wrong, but he still does not understand God's action fully. That's the people, place, and time. In the background of the lesson, Job was a man of great wealth who suddenly found himself losing everything, even his children, sudden loss, perplexed to Job because he had always been upright and blameless. A God-fearing man, a Job 1-1, he continued to worship and praise God even such a great loss. Rather than blame God for his suffering, Job simply, simply mourn and seek the counsel of friends. But his friends just couldn't figure out what Job might have done. That he was so terrible, that was so terrible that God had brought all these sufferings upon him. I think I've already mentioned what I wrote here as a note for this in the Old Testament. So blessings for obedience and discipline for disobedience was what Job's friends were looking at. If you do not well, sin lieth at the at your door. That's Genesis four and seven. The in-depth verses we've already read them to you. We'll just repeat them again. 
God is perfect, perfectly just. A just God will punish sin, and a just God will bless the obedient. And a just God will restore repentance. Search the scriptures. Read Job 8 and 4, John 9, 1 through 3. Romans 6, 23. What singular message do we take away from these verses? Discuss how the penalty of sin has not changed, but the way God deals with the sinner has. Read Job 8, 20, verses 20 through 20, 8, 20 through 21 and Romans 3.21 through 26. How does the promise of God's restoration and the gift of salvation by faith demonstrates God's justice? We know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life that has not changed that is still true under the Old Testament dispensation we didn't have grace manifested as we have it now in the New Testament John 1 9 said if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness Amen. Discuss the meaning. It is easy to fall into thinking that God blesses us because we're good and punish, punishment comes from specific sins. We, we've discussed this before. However, this understanding does not allow God's grace because of Jesus' completed work of redemption namely his praying paying the price of our sin now live in the age of grace which we just mentioned the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through faith we can all receive the gift of eternal life how does this knowledge affect our attitude towards sin? We don't use God's grace as a license to sin, but we do understand that we confess our sins. He is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Liberating lesson, as we gonna move to a close here in a minute. The book of Job does not explain the reason for all suffering. Nor does Jesus' explanation of why man was born blind, why the man was born blind in John 9 and 3. What Jesus seemed to be telling us is that sometimes we just won't understand. Yet we have to trust in all things. Well, somehow everything will work out for our good, to his glory and good. While we are tempted to seek answers for the reasons for our suffering, what things should, should we ask God instead of face when we are faced with our suffering or injustice. I said ask him for understanding and the power to keep the faith that we all grow in grace and in the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So Job's friend, Elipad, 
Bildad and Zophar sat with Job, but they didn't have the right ideas in mind to help him. That's our lesson. May we learn from these lessons that we might be better stewards of God's word. Let's close with a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we're grateful to you that you've allowed us to spend this time with these people today out in the land of television. We pray, O oh God, that you open up our hearts and understanding that we may continue to labor in this time, which is unusual for us, but we're doing the best we can. Thank you for these who are working with us to see that we can be instruments of help at this time. Bless, we pray. Continue to keep us in your keeping power. Thank you for grace and mercy. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.